Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and a very hearty welcome to you all. What a privilege it is to celebrate such a special occasion with old and new friends. 1999 is a very special year for me, as it marks my 21st anniversary. Yes, believe it or not, the original monocoque hull concept was first devised in 1977. Travel with me as we rekindle memories of the good times and disappointments we have shared since my birth. Landmines are among the most treacherous weapons used in conventional warfare. They strike indiscriminately and never miss, continuing to kill long after hostilities have ceased. The Hippo and Buffalo Troop carrier vehicles and their crew had to contend with these inhumane weapons daily during the South African Security Forces' involvement in the low-intensity border war in the 70s. It wasn't long before the Hippo and Buffalo began to feel the punch, and eventually they could no longer be operationally repaired at a cost-effective rate. At the same time, the then South African Police Force had indicated the need for a special multi-purpose vehicle for use in Africa's infamous difficult terrain. Under Project Geisha, the Applied Chemistry Unit of the CSIR began research and development work and constructed the first monocoque hull in 1977 using a hippo body and Bedford components. They named it the Crocodile. If looks had been the deciding factor at this stage, the vehicle would never have been developed further. In 1978, the Applied Chemistry Unit developed a second prototype vehicle with a lower silhouette and better features than the Crocodile. At the same time, Arms Corps developed two Hippo Mark II vehicles, one with a chassis and one with a semi-monocoque hull design. All three of these vehicles used Bedford components, which later proved to be unreliable and underpowered. At the initiative of Colonel Bux Lombard of the South African Medical Services, the Chemical Defense Unit developed the Flossy Ambulance using Mercedes-Benz components. This eventually led to the production of 44 Rinkhaus ambulances based on Samuel 50 Mark I driveline components. The South African police was operationally committed to the war in the then Rhodesia and the border conflict in Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia. They were very conscious of the need for a replacement for the hippo, which owing to its instability had serious shortcomings in off-road applications. General Piet Kruger, now retired, introduced the concept demonstrator to senior officers of the then SAP and instructed Kurs de Wett of UCDD and Gus Modlin of TFM to develop a powerful vehicle which was better engineered for production. A development budget of 30,000 Rand was arranged and the UCDD and TFM contributed a considerable amount from their own budget. The prototype was delivered in 1979. Obviously, a good design is essential in such a vehicle. So I was subjected to mobility trials in Pretoria and the White River region and was fitted with 1,200 by 20 tires. At some stage during all this activity, the first production order for 30 vehicles was placed and was followed by a further order for 155 to the company Henred Freuhoff. The last 40 of these vehicles were built by TFM in the specially constructed factory at Ullifonsfontein. Utilizing an OM352 natural aspirated engine and 1200 by 20 tires, we were produced at a unit price of 7,000 Rand. I was named the Casper Mark I. UCDD delivered all my driveline components, while TFM constructed my body and did the final assembly and delivery. Once Arms Corps' technical personnel had been introduced to my production version, they suggested the prototype vehicle be upgraded with a turbo engine and 1400 by 20 tires. 
this UCDD did at their own cost. I was renamed Susper to differentiate me from the production units. Kurs Joubert of Arms Corps conducted stringent operational tests on me, including mine blast tests with the CSIR. I must mention that my engine was running during these detonation trials, which proved that the monocoque hull also protected my organs. The report of this operational evaluation, as well as feedback from the Kufut teams in Southwest Africa, led to several modifications. And from 1981, I became known as the Kasper Mark IIA. Smaller modifications later placed me on Mark IIB and Mark IIC status. Operational requirements and mobility limitations in wet conditions, owing to the non-availability of a differential lock in the Mercedes-Benz front axle, led to the development of the Casper Mark III. Introduced in 1984, these vehicles were fitted with ZF axles, which offered a limited slip differential capability to ease the driver's task. A short wheelbase called Casper Dumpy was also developed and showed outstanding vehicle performance. Decision makers rejected this concept, however, because it carried two crew members less than we did. Besides the troop carrier, the SAP understood the concept of a family of vehicles to ease the operational and logistics burden and instructed TFM to develop a recovery vehicle, cargo carrier and fuel tanker called the Gemsbok, Blessbok and Daker, respectively. It felt good to know that I met all the user's requirements of mobility, reliability, mine protection against multiple mines, ballistic protection, bush protection, ease of maintenance and cost effectiveness. Besides my excellent protection against anti-tank mines, Another outstanding feature was that I could be refurbished up to seven times before needing major repairs to the hull. The cost per detonation and downtime was drastically reduced with guaranteed high operational mobility. I was not only beautifully proportioned, being 6.9 meters long, 2.45 meters wide and 2.85 meters high, but I also weighed a solid 11 tons. Enough for a wheeled vehicle to sustain the onslaught of anti-tank mines and still deliver excellent performance. I could travel at a speed of 98 kilometers an hour and climb 60% gradients with ease. My crew confirmed my exceptional strategic and tactical off-road capabilities. I was responsible not only for transporting a crew of up to 14 soldiers, but also for protecting them. My loyal nature meant my crew could always rely on me, even in remote areas where there was no support. I carried their 200 liters of drinking water and a combination of light and heavy machine guns from 7.62 mm caliber to 20 mm cannons. I'd also been fitted with excellent communication and navigation systems. No wonder some of my crew regarded me as an African infantry combat vehicle. Together, we made a formidable team, and the soldiers' morale was always high. Up until now, I'd been used in three major scenarios. Riot control situations, border war conflicts, and humanitarian mining operations. When my country went through a stressful transition phase, I played a significant supportive role in combating crime in South Africa. My height and interior volume enabled my crew to observe flashpoints for several days and then react quickly when necessary. I received several special features while performing this role, such as wire cutters, steel roofs, a window mesh protection, bush bars, searchlight and a public address system. My involvement in riot control and crime prevention has since been taken over by the RG12 Vinyala, which is considered more acceptable to the public. Personally, 
I considered border war conflicts to be the real test of my capabilities. Mines were detonated almost daily, and I had to perform follow-on cross-border operations. Believe me, traveling through dense bush under the constant threat of landmines is no joke. Weather conditions were extreme. Summer temperatures reached 40 degrees Celsius during the day, and in winter, dropped as low as minus 10 at night. To make matters worse, we also had to contend with rain and marshland. Sometimes, infantry companies only advanced two kilometers in three days. I can recall many times when bridges had to be built with trees so that we could cross riverbeds. Sometimes the driver's judgment was not so good and we had a hell of a time recovering a vehicle from the river. When crossing roads, my crew first had to do a sweep with detectors to minimize the likelihood of detonating mines before my friends and I could cross. My crew and I had to be tough in our encounters with the bush that scratched our bodies and the sun that burned us to a cinder. At night, the tension was palpable and the cold cut through us like a knife. But our hardships were all worth it in the end. When we reached our destination safely, we could look back proudly and share some emotional moments together. Ah, we were a great team. Of course, sometimes we did not reach our destination in one piece. Because of my high level of mine protection and mobility in the bush, the enemy laid specific mine patterns with large amounts of explosives. They also set ambushes and used anti-tank systems against us. I clearly remember the day my crew and I were ambushed. A TMK-2 anti-tank mine penetrated my guts and the ensuing shrapnel caused extensive injuries which eventually led to the deaths of four of my crew members. This was indeed a sad day. The first South African police cusper to arrive at Sector 10 was immediately ordered to do a reconnaissance with hippo vehicles. It wasn't long before we detonated the mine with the right front wheel. My crew escaped with no injuries at all. This incident boosted confidence considerably and a message was sent to Pretoria to continue with production. At 101 Battalion in the then Sector 10 operational area, the CASPA was first used by Colonel Tom Ferreira, from where the name TFM was adapted to Tom Ferreira's men. The first 12 CASPAs were allocated to his team. CASPA serial number TFM 11666 had an interesting history with 101 Battalion and was known as the Devil's Cusper. It was the first Cusper of 101 Battalion to detonate a mine, and also the first to detonate two separate mines on the same day. In both incidents, the vehicle was repaired under operational conditions. Sadly, TFM 11666 was also the first Cusper in which serious injuries to my human friends occurred. On the day it happened, we were traveling through dense bush and drove into an ambush. An enemy soldier positioned above us in a tree fired a 60 mm SKS rifle grenade onto the roof of the Casper, which detonated at the commander's hatch, causing serious facial and chest injuries to some of my crew. One of them passed away recently. On another occasion, a fellow Casper was traveling at 80 km an hour when it detonated a mine under its right front wheel and overturned. One crew member broke his collarbone and another suffered a broken right leg. I also remember the day one of my fellow Cuspers detonated a double TM57 mine with its front wheel on a tar road near Alpha Tower. The crew was flung out and slid over the rough tar surface, but only suffered minor scratches and bruises. A happier memory is the day TFM 11666 was painted pink and donated to the local creche for the children's playground. Undoubtedly, the threat my crew feared the most was the RPG-7 anti-tank weapon. I recall several occasions when projectiles penetrated my body from the side, killing the crew members who were in the direct line of fire. A wooden liner of 18mm chipboard was later fitted to my interior to reduce the spalling angle of shrapnel 
and restrict injuries to the crew. We Caspers were doing a pretty good job, as we were tough, reliable, cost-effective and always willing to work. It wasn't long before we were being used in other roles. My cousin, Plofada, was used to breach conventional minefields, while some of us were converted into ambulances and command vehicles. More recently, other cuspers were converted to 81mm mortar and 106mm recoilless gun carriers. Altogether, 1,700 of us were produced, 1,520 for the South African forces and 180 for foreign customers. Mechem developed a 6x4 Cespa prototype to detonate mines with the sacrificial front wheels, thus saving on costs and operational downtime. This was only a concept, however, and did not reach production status. During operational service, we Caspers probably detonated more than 360 anti-tank mines, many of which were multiple mines laid in specific patterns to destroy me and my crew. For those statisticians among you, consider these facts. Over a period of four and a half years, 229 mines were detonated, causing injury to 252 soldiers, resulting in the death of 12. Although this is very distressing, the good news is that the greater part of my crew remained safe when traveling with me. We also proved ourselves in humanitarian operations throughout the world, such as Project Terra Limpa in Mozambique. Steel wheels enabled us to drive through anti-personnel minefields which had been laid years ago and are regarded as unsafe to clear by hand. Clearing the Kawara Basa power line from Sondo to South Africa was another tough job. In only two months, we covered a distance of 1,800 kilometers through dense bush. No wonder this project is jokingly referred to as the longest safari rally with armored cars. My crew and I had to withstand severe environmental conditions of heat, rain, tough vegetation, and poisonous insects and snakes. During these clearing operations, we detonated many anti-tank mines, as in this case, a TM-57 mine under the right front wheel. After a two-hour field repair exercise, we were on the move again. In Angola, our biggest problem was the lack of roads and bridges. Here, my 4x4 capability really came to the fore, and I had to use it often to get my crew to their destination. I remember one time when I detonated an anti-tank mine boosted with mortar shells. Once again, I survived, and my crew and I were soon mobile again. For these operations, Casper vehicles had to be adapted so that vapor detection kits for sampling the air, plows, steel disc rollers, mine detection sensors and hydraulic hoists could be fitted. International mine clearing teams regard me as an essential item in their toolbox. In the early 90s, Arms Corps and TFM began to market us Caspers aggressively to potential foreign customers. The first live demonstration to an international audience was performed at the International IDEX 95 exhibition in Abu Dhabi. Quirce Schubert and Leon Cornelius drove me over a South African number eight anti-tank mine. Not only were the crew unharmed, but it took them only 37 minutes to carry out repairs and have me operational again. At IDEX 97, my high level of mine protection was effectively demonstrated when my crew and I detonated two South African number eight mines simultaneously, one under each rear wheel. Note the confidence my crew had in my protection. Some of my fellow customers have emigrated to Peru and are operating in the Andes Mountains, successfully restricting the movement of drug dealers. Recently, Roymek, which acquired TFM's military business, signed an agreement to deliver more than 150 Caspers to India to function in their operational areas, including the Kashmir region. Friends, the Indian Defence Force, my newest customer, subjected me to stringent testing before placing an order. 
I had to drive more than 4,000 kilometers in operational conditions. I survived four mine detonations and countless live firing trials before driving back to the port at Bombay under my own steam. Unfortunately, I am not amphibious and had to return to South Africa by ship. Final modifications were done to me to get me in shape to meet the user requirements. In an attempt to find a suitable replacement for us in the SANDF, like with the Buffalo, all sorts of projects such as Remark, Mingue and Felskun were initiated. They were all terminated for various reasons. And it is interesting to note that users still consider us Gaspers to be the most suitable and cost-effective solution to date. On the whole, we've been well looked after. Our drive lines are old and certain major aggregates are no longer available as production items. But spare parts are readily available. Should Project Ambition 2 continue, the Casper concept with a new drive line will most definitely feature prominently in the project study. An elementary infantry personnel carrier that is reliable and easy to maintain will probably be good for South Africa and Asadic countries. Over the past 21 years, we Caspers have become a trusted friend to many soldiers, policemen and users throughout the world. Special memories will be treasured for many years to come. I understand that we may be called upon to operate in peacekeeping missions. If that happens, I have only this to say. Just make sure that my logistical backup is available and I won't let you down. My pioneers need to be congratulated, for they were indirectly responsible for saving countless military and civilian lives. Gaspers have gained a worldwide reputation as the safest mine-protected vehicle ever to be developed and put into full-scale production. Our operational success with various forces and in different theatres throughout the world have demonstrated that a monocoque hull design was the correct way to go for wheeled mine-protected vehicles. Many other products have followed this approach, such as the Mfazi, Mamba, RG31 and Cobra. It has been wonderful to meet old and new friends on this special occasion. Thank you to everyone who helped make this day possible. The realistic outdoor display brings back many memories, which will be talked about for years to come. I wish all of you the very best for the future. I salute you and all those friends who could not be here with us. God bless us and our beloved South Africa.